Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable. 1 and 1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator. And our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue. Notice I did not say we are trying to fund a million companies. But of course, we do have companies in the portfolio who are looking to raise money, and uh, we do support that effort. And we have lots of investor-related programming. You will see some today. This is our 385th session of this free pro pro uh, roundtables, mentoring roundtables. And um, they've been going on since 2008. So uh, it's a... It's been a very long journey, and it's been a very exciting, interesting journey to learn what you are doing in different parts of the world, and, um, and it's been really fascinating. Uh, the event is being recorded. You will find recordings of this and all our prior roundtable recordings on the YouTube channel 1M1M Roundtables. If you're live tweeting today, please use 1M1M, the hashtag. And uh, our Twitter handles are at 1M by 1M and at Shromana. You could, could retweet those as well. Um, these are the call-in instructions. Remember, this is a round table, so we want you to participate, all of you to participate as much as you want and as much as you can. Uh, so participate with questions, participate with comments, weigh in with your perspectives. Use the public chat, and, and I will also tell you when the line is open for you to call in. You can also call in and participate. We're going to start today with a conversation with Nitin Rai, Managing Director of Elevate Capital. Nitin has been a very active angel investor and a seed investor in the industry. Nitin, welcome to the program. Thank you. So tell us about your uh, seed stage investment activities. Let's get to know you and get you in, uh, introduced into our community. Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, my background is I started out as an entrepreneur in, back in the 80s in Silicon Valley and moved to Oregon uh, in the late 80s, uh, started a company called First Insight, and then got involved with an organization called Thai, uh, the sure. Indus Entrepreneurs, and we launched the Oregon chapter in 2007, and mm -hmm. uh, which was right in the middle of the, you know, literally right before the meltdown. And, and you know, when, when there is an economic downturn, uh, there's lots and lots of entrepreneurs who uh, are then, you know, creating companies and looking for funding. And I got involved in, uh, through Thai, um, I was the champion for angel funding. Um, mm -hmm. And we have invested in a number of startups in Oregon, uh, several of them women-led, and mm -hmm. uh, started getting some really great results. As a matter of fact, our first Seed investment was in a company called Zapproved, uh, CEO Monica Enan. Uh, she just recently sold her company to Vista Private Equity. Huge returns, probably the best returns we've seen in the last yeah. several years. As, and what uh, is the company? What does the company do? Uh, the company is called Zapproved, Z-A-P-P-R-O-V-E-D. Uh, they're in the legal tech space. Uh, they okay. do legal hold. Uh, so it's Great. a B2B company. Um, Great outcome, um, and uh, as a matter of fact, Monica is a charter member in Thai, um, and so we we really uh, in in uh, in Portland, being a small ecosystem, Thai angels became a force to reckon with in terms of yeah. deploying of early stage capital, taking very early risks, mm -hmm. and from that experience and um, and really the work that we did, Elevate Capital was born. Yeah. Um, I launched Elevate Capital two years ago, a uh, little over two, uh, about two years ago, and we have two funds. Uh, there is a fund called Elevate Inclusive that mm -hmm. exclusively invests in women and minorities in communities of color. It's a public-private fund. Um, okay. It's two and a half million. We've already made all our investments. We made about 20 investments. Uh, very early stage, highly diverse. It's mm -hmm. not a tech. It invests across the board in different industries. Uh, the sister fund, which is a larger fund called Elevate Capital, 
Uh, we haven't closed it yet. We've raised about 60% of the 10 million, and we've made 10 investments as well. And these are, again, early stage companies, but, uh, you know, we invest in everybody. It's all inclusive. And um, we invest between 100 to 500,000. And these are usually pre A Series C type investments uh, mm -hmm. with room for follow on. Okay. So, so, in total, in the last, I would say, six years, I've invested between the fund and personally and along with the Thai ecosystem about 50 startups. All right, excellent. So we have very deep uh, seed investment expertise here, folks. Let's uh, let's learn from Nitin what uh, you know what's happening in the Oregon ecosystem and uh, what what are the learnings. So before we uh, we go there, Nitin, I want to get a couple of. Um, points just underscored. So your investment activity is completely in Oregon? Is it exclusively in Oregon, geography-wise? Uh, the geography is really Pacific Northwest with the okay. ability to do some investments outside, and we've actually done two investments outside of Oregon uh, and Washington, uh, and that is uh, a comp there's a company in San Francisco called Blendor, and we have also invested in a company in New York called Resi. Okay. And what is your um, industry sector sweet spot? What do you like to invest in? What kinds of companies? So we're actually somewhat, somewhat, somewhat agnostic. Um, we started out doing mostly tech, uh, B2B was sort of our sweet spot. But we've since, uh, because of the inclusive fund, we've actually done a, f a fair number of consumer internet product uh, because we are in, so specifically we're in what I call tech, and tech includes B2B, some B2C, uh, uh, VR, um, we're just about to do a cannabis deal, which is mostly on the technology side. Uh, we have done some bioscience, um, I, some apparel, uh, and most of these industries are actually tech-enabled. Uh, so there's very few companies that I would say, other than the bioscience company that we did, uh, mm -hmm. I would say we have, don't have a technology uh, component, whether it's e-commerce or a medical device, but there's some technology component that's involved in, in these companies. Got it. So um, can you, you've invested in a lot of companies in the last six years, and, and I imagine you have a very good uh, deal flow, so you have a unique angle and perspective into what's happening in the industry, especially with the Pacific Northwest and specifically Oregon uh, deal flow. What trends are you seeing in the deals that are coming to you? So because we had this in intentionality of, of investing in what we call the underserved entrepreneurs, and our definition of that is, you know, women, communities of color, minorities, yeah. and also underserved regions. So we don't just invest in Portland, but even areas that are outside of Portland where yeah. there's difficulty for these entrepreneurs to get access to early stage capital. Uh, and that also includes some of the industries like apparel, sports, food, where you don't see a lot of VC activity. So we've positioned ourselves as a fund that's intentional about investing in those kinds of companies. Now, it's not that we wouldn't look at other types of deals, but what that did is gave us a deal flow, overwhelming deal flow of women entrepreneurs. So 70% of our investments are in women founders. Okay. But that's, and that, uh, what I would say, is, is very unique for, for Elevate, and we get deal flow from all over the country. Unfortunately, given our geographic location, we tend to more invest locally, but uh, that seems to be a, a, very, a very strong underlying current of entrepreneurs that we're seeing. We have women coming out of all, all over the country that are applying to Elevate for funding. Okay. And what about um, industry trends, tech trends? Mm -hmm. So from an industry standpoint, wonderful. we see a very diverse uh, uh, a group of, uh, of entrepreneurs that are applying. So obviously it's, you know, between 40 to 60% is technology. Uh, and on the technology side, of course, we see SaaS deals. We're seeing VR. Uh, the VR, AR, VR activity is really picking up. Uh, we mm -hmm. see a lot of IoT. Uh, we see a fair amount of medical device type companies. 
Um, we see apparel. We see sports. Um, so let's bio um, science. Let me double click down into. We are, you know, we are exclusively focused on IT and IT enabled services. So I'm going to double click down on on your activity in that sector, and, and uh -huh. I have a few questions based on what you said. Yeah. So AR, VR, what are you seeing in AR, VR? What kinds of deals? Are these content deals? Are these equipment deals? What, what's the... Actually, uh, um, uh, some of them are, have been software deals. So we are, and I can't disclose the details yet because the, the investment is not closed, but it's actually B2B uh, AR, VR. So it's it's a, a platform yeah. that that helps uh, people um, build things, uh, uh, you know, directed primarily towards the uh, the architects and designers. Uh, there is a deal that we didn't invest, couldn't invest in that was more of a platform to build applications on AR VR. Uh, we yeah. haven't seen a whole lot of content. There's been some content, but I think a lot of that activity is down in Southern California. Uh, not much, or perhaps Northern California, but not much in Oregon. That is true. That is true. Now, um, let's talk about a few of your uh, highlights uh, in your portfolio, in your investments um, uh -huh. so far. And you started off with the legal tech company. I'd love to learn a bit more about it. And by the way, um, please uh, feel free to introduce the entrepreneur to us, and we'll be delighted to do a story on her uh, Jerry, oh, she would be Jerry, a, she please. is just a rock star. Uh, well, rock happy to make the introduction. Great. So tell us a little bit about her story. How did she find you and how did, uh, you know, what stage did you invest in? What was, what did you see in that company at the beginning that gave you the confidence that this was going to go? Okay, sure. So Monica uh, Inand uh, is a, a former Intel employee, IBM. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to Cornell, uh, got an MBA, and um, I think uh, around 2006, uh, she left IBM because she wanted to be an entrepreneur and had an idea. And the idea basically was that this approved uh, idea was really, it was a B2B type uh, uh, play where, you know, at that point, it's a workflow, it was a workflow product. Uh, you know, you know, it's a pretty known fact that, you know, we get overwhelmed with emails, and as CEOs and executives, we get a lot of emails for approvals. Approve this, approve that. Well, she created a very simple system where any email for approval would come through her system, and you say, approve or not approved. I love the idea. So I became one of her early customers, and, you know, she launched the product, I think, in, uh, sometime in 2008, and, um, and was a uh, out raising money, a lot of interest from venture capitalists in, in Silicon Valley, and then the markets took a dip. Mm -hmm. And so th that funding ran out. So mm -hmm. she was looking for capital. She called me up and said, hey, I need some angel money. You know, I'm, I'm pivoting. And I think during the process, she ran into this opportunity of actually pivoting towards legal, where there yeah. was an opportunity to, you know, when, when companies get sued, they need to hold everything back. Emails, you know, documents, uh, mm -hmm. any kind of interaction around that lawsuit, they need to hold back all of the communication. So her system was kind of a natural fit in that problem space. And because it was SaaS, there was the, she was the first SaaS company uh, mm -hmm. there. So she was pivoting. She wanted to raise some money. I made some introductions into the Thai network. We didn't have an angel program back then. And uh, little I knew, she raised half a million from Thai. Mm -hmm. And it got her started <clears throat> to scale. And then over time, she raised about, I think, 1.7 or 1.8 million. And that's all she raised in her uh, in, entire sort of what I call the, the pre, pre kind of uh, complete sale of the company. And then she built a great business. She hired a great team. Uh, yeah. She started getting a lot of corporate clients like Yahoo. Uh, and over the years, had I think she got to about a few million in revenue. And then a big private equity firm came in and bought half of our shares out, plunked a bunch of money in, allowed her to yeah. grow even more. And uh, this last year, uh, Vista Private Equity came in and made a big offer and bought everybody out. Company, all right. And how All far the, did she reach from a revenue point of view? 
Um, I think she was, um, and I'll let her talk about that, but I think she was probably close to $10 million in revenue okay. when this happened. Uh, turning $1.7 million investment or thereabouts, maybe $2.5 million investment into $10 million annual revenue run rate, that's a very, very well-executed uh, story. Absolutely, and Vista gave a nice markup, and, and we're all happy, and she is now on to do even bigger and better things because Vista Private Equity is the largest SaaS private equity firm in the world. Yeah. They have, I don't know, how many billions in management, and, and so uh, she's, she's a big story in, in Portland. <clears throat> Very good. Uh, Excellent. Considering the fact Excellent. that, you know, she had no venture capital. Uh, she raised zero VC money. It was all angel funding. You know, I've seen other, we've done stories on other companies from Oregon that have that dynamic of very capital efficient, mostly angel funded, not much in venture capital, but very tight execution. Uh, we did a story on Share ID, which you probably know them. Uh, I think they're Eugene based, not even Portland. Yeah. Um, I'm an investor ID. I'm an early okay. investor. Yeah. All right. So, so we did that story very early on. They were already quite successful. I think they were mm -hmm. already over $5 million in revenue, but with very, very little capital. So we love stories like this. And, and it's, you know, the truth is this is how the entrepreneurship ecosystem of the world, not Silicon Valley and not the, you know, hubs that are flooded with capital, but most of the world operates this way. And, and we've done case study after case study of these capital-efficient success stories, mm -hmm. and we love these kinds of stories. Well, I have 20 of those now in my fund. Great. Well, we should uh, we should make sure they get their recognition. You know, that this is part of the problem with our industry is that uh, the media focuses on funding announcements. So these kinds yeah. of companies don't get a lot of coverage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the saddest story of this is, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not a sad story. It's a great story. But, uh, you know, 10 years ago, Sridhar Vembu came to see me at my house in Silicon Valley, and uh, he pitched me a company to write about called Zoho. And nobody heard wow. about Zoho, nobody wrote about Zoho, nobody said, oh. mentioned Zoho. And I was the first to write about Zoho, and, and today Zoho is approaching a billion dollars in revenue and no financing. He has taken zero no. outside financing. Yeah. So tell us, um, tell us more about um, what your perspective is, and, and I'm going to very clearly zero in on a trend question, which is very, I think it's close to your heart. Um, the way I'm observing the way you invest and the way you, you know, the kind of companies you like to invest in is, is kind of, uh, emblematic of where we are in the history of technology, right? We are in 2018, February, and um, a ton of stuff has already been built. You know, there's so much technology that has been built. It's not like, you know, today, if you want to build another Salesforce.com, it's that easy because there is a Salesforce.com and there's all kinds of other things that are big and there are yeah. a lot of incumbents and so forth, but there are so many niches, right? Or do you just describe this great story of a legal tech niche? There, you know, mm -hmm. sheer ID is a niche. There's all kinds of niches where you can build, you know, capital efficient, very, very good companies that can have very good outcomes, just like the one you just described. So I take it that this is definitely part of your investment thesis, yes? Yes, I'm a, I'm a niche guy. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear that because, you know, um, I, I would say just in the last six months, I've probably talked to 80 investors who operate in this general uh, ecosystem of pre-seed, seed, post-seed, pre pre-series A and small series A funds. And a l large number of them are still looking for unicorns. Now, there are about 600 or more uh, you know, funds, micro VCs that are operating in this space, if everybody looks for unicorns, it is just mathematically not viable. Correct. So I don't chase unicorns, by the way. If a unicorn Good. comes to me, I say, go talk to, go to the valley, go to, talk to the big guys. I'm not for you. So I'm very clear about, 
and very focused on who I want to invest in. So my okay. thesis is I want to come in very early. I want to take the biggest risk. I want to mentor these uh, entrepreneurs, and I'm looking for early exits, and I'm not ashamed about that. Um, I like to get in early and get out early. Yeah. Uh, so with that strategy, um, I can't talk about my fund right now in terms of what the fund could return, but mm -hmm. as an angel investor that invested uh, along with a group of other Thai angels, if we were a fund, in four years, we returned almost 3.5x of mm -hmm. our original investment, okay? And, and many, many of those investments like Share ID are still around. So mm -hmm. our IRR would be a phenomenal IRR, like 40, 45%. So we know that if you come in early, mentor the entrepreneurs, and you find companies that have those vertical, there are in those vertical niches where there's not a lot of competition, and you've got a great CEO, you can put together a great team that really executes and is capital efficient, you can build a five, ten million dollar business and sell it for, if it's in the SaaS space, you know, you can go to five to ten X, right? And you can get really great returns without the, what I call the let's launch, let's invest in 20 jumbo jets and 18 will crash and two will, you know, be right. the big, you know, A or B. This is a venture model. This is your traditional venture model. I don't believe in that model, to tell you the truth. Uh, today I'm a, I call myself as a very small private equity player. Where we're coming in, we, we not only provide uh, capital, but we provide uh, great mentors. Uh, we have great entrepreneurs that are investors in our fund or in the Thai ecosystem. And what we what we provide the entrepreneur is that feedback, the the, the guidance that they really need to execute well. Uh, and that's like 80% of the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can solve that at that very early stage, the chances of success are far higher, and the returns yeah. can go from 2x to 5x to 7x. So that's our model. So one question on that. Uh, you said you like early exits. Um, does that mean that if the company is raising more money um, uh, in, you know, after your angel round, you actually sell out in those rounds? If we have an opportunity, we will. Yeah. Okay. Or we cool. might advise the company. You know, they've been around three, four years. They've, they've. Um, you know, the, the biggest issue for any company, once they hit the two, three million dollar threshold, is then they need substantial capital, no matter what the industry is, uh, to scale. And depending on who the funder and the investor is, many times you see these growth equity firms coming in or large strategic investors coming in. You know, they may want to own most of the company, right? They may want to take a larger portion of the company. And at that point, you know, we are the small potatoes, right? Um, we may not have follow-on capital to keep our prorata uh, yes, exactly. ownership. And, and if the markups are great, you know, we may just sell out. And it could be a, a 2 xer or 2 and a half xer in, in a year to 18 months. It's, yeah. it's a great return, great IRR. So yeah, we're open think, to that. Uh, you know, the, the reality is that getting from zero to one million annual revenue run rate or two million annual revenue run rate is really hard. But once you get there, and if you can show repeatability, if you can show uh, velocity, the amount of capital available to those kinds of companies, and if there is enough TAM in the uh, project, there is a ton of capital chasing those kinds of deals. In Silicon Valley, yes, not in Oregon. But, you know, Silicon Valley investors these days invest easily in Oregon. I mean, Oregon is very easy, actually. But Pacific Northwest is very easy. Silicon Valley investors no longer just invest here. I, I know that, but it's still harder when you're an Oregon-based company to go out and raise uh, substantial amounts of capital from outside. Now, there are more and more companies that are coming in, more VC firms are looking at Oregon, but typically when, we talk, when I've talked to Silicon Valley investors, their response is, well, we like to invest in our backyard. So we like companies to be based here. Some rather do, than... I think some do, some do. It really depends. If it's, if it's talking about very early stage stuff, they tend to like to invest in their backyard. Oh. But then uh, when it comes to something a bit more mature and, and 
more proven, they have more flexibility. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't want to discount the capital that is now available in Portland and Oregon now uh, yeah. as well, because I think it used to be Series A used to be a real difficult uh, a process for Oregon companies to raise money because you had to go out of state. Now there's enough funds and enough sort of co-investment happening that a number of companies are able to get to Series A within yeah. Oregon. They don't need to go outside. Who are your uh, favorite uh, Series A partners in the Oregon area that are local? So funds? I've done four deals with Voyager Capital. Yeah. Um, Diane Freeman. Um, we've done a number of deals with uh, Oregon Angel Fund, which is now kind of evolved from being sort of the early seed to um, to Series A. So those mm -hmm. funds are the two that we've done most what I call Series A deals with. Uh, we've mm -hmm. done a fair number of deals with Portland Seed Fund. Uh, there's uh, Rogue Ventures. There's Seven Peaks. I've done a couple of deals with Rogue Ventures. Uh, Seven Peaks is out of Bend, Oregon. There's Cascade Angels. And, you know, we, yeah. we all end up in at least one or two deals together. together. Um, yeah, sure. There's, there's a lot of uh, synergy between uh, the, the local funds. There's a fund called W2 in Eugene, Oregon. There's a bunch of angel conferences, uh, one called Ben Venture Conference, which is a fairly substantial angel conference. Uh, we, we've done a number of investments with the BBC angels where they create a fund and we co-invest. And is the philosophy that you described of uh, avoiding unicorns and then kind of like steering the unicorns in the direction of Silicon Valley and then focusing on the niches, is that philosophy shared by your uh, peer group in Oregon? I think I'm unique in that one. You are unique in that one. That's interesting, huh? So I'm very explicit. Your peer group is just I'm, I'm very, very explicit. And sometimes they'll shut me up and they say, don't talk about that. You know, so I, I, I'm, I'm actually religious about that strategy. Okay, interesting to know that. <laughs> and uh, if you were to look at, I don't know if this, there's been any study or you have any maybe back of the envelope estimate, how many seed stage companies are in the pool, let's say in the 2017 vintage, how many companies are there in the seed pool? Well, we made most of our investments in 2017 out of the fund. Mm -hmm. um, so if I look at when you say pool, are you talking about people who are looking for funding or people that have received funding? Uh, actually, both. I think if you have one number or the other number or both, I would be interested in well, both of we, those numbers. In, so when we announced the inclusive fund in 2016, within, um, within three weeks, we had 1,000 people apply mm -hmm. on our website. So that gives you an idea of the number of people, are, and this most of them are from Oregon. Yeah. Um, I don't have the statistics, but I would say we have made almost 20 investments out of the fund just mm -hmm. in 2017. As a matter of fact, in 18 months, we have exhausted our first round investments from yeah. both funds. Uh, and that's just, uh, you know, Elevate. Uh, OF, Oregon Angel Fund, makes about four to six investments a year. Um, I think Cascade Angel makes about the same, uh, but there's some overlap. Portland Seed Fund does. Now, they haven't. They were raising their funds, so I don't think they made a lot of investments last year. They did a lot of follow-on. But I'd say, you know, there's roughly, in 2017, at least 30 to 40 companies got funded uh, mm -hmm. for seed funding, which is a pretty substantial number. Mm-hmm. That doesn't so, include any so about a thousand or, companies looking another, and thirty to forty got funded. That's that's kind correct. of what you're saying. That's yeah. good. That's good. Good numbers. Yeah. Very good. Well, um, Nitin, it's been a pleasure getting to know you a bit. If you're down in the valley, uh, let let's have lunch and. Uh, I would love to. Now that I we have this face contact, I would love to do that. Okay. Uh, you know, I am the new chair of Thai Global, so I'll be down there um, more often. Um, well, and so I'm I will in let Central you off. Park, right off Sand Hill Road, so let's uh, let's get together. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you for coming today. Bye, folks. Uh, we're going to switch to the entrepreneur pitch session next. Nitin has to run; he has a meeting, but uh, we will continue. Um, just to set a few expectations before you pitch. 
Remember, this is a safe working session, right? We are working together on your strategy, how you can accelerate your journey a bit, and, and we are trying to give you feedback based on our experience. So don't feel defensive. Don't feel like you have to, you know, um, you have to feel embarrassed or anything. We are, we know that you are in early stages, you're, you're most likely a first time entrepreneur. You, your knowledge is limited about the, you know, entrepreneurship journey. All that is fine. That's why we are doing this to democratize entrepreneurship education, incubation, and acceleration. Now, it is possible that you might disagree with my feedback. Just remember this that I'm giving you feedback based on my experience. You have a certain perspective. Consider my feedback, and then you decide what you're going to do. It's your company. So strategy, where you're going to go, how you want to go about doing what you want to do, is entirely up to you. Remember one thing, though, not all businesses can raise money. Not all businesses should raise money, and raising money does not guarantee success. There are lots of companies that built to very significant scale. I just told you the story of uh, Zoho earlier, zero outside financing, approaching a billion dollars in annual revenue. So there are, there's an incredible, incredible amount of, um, you know, bootstrapped success story in our case study portfolio. You can learn from them, and that's fine too. That is a fine path to success, and of course, we also have plenty of activity on the financing side, so you're welcome to pursue that route as well. It actually, you're going to have to use, take your business, analyze your business, frame your business using the right metrics, and then decide what is the right financing strategy for you, and we'll be happy to help you do that. Okay, we're going to go to Philippe Cornell as the first presenter. Philippe, please uh, go ahead and uh, tell us what you're working on. Unmute your line. Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Can Thank hear you very you. much. Thanks very much, Ramana. So, um, my name is Philip Cornell. I just wanted to present PM First. So, what are we trying to do with the PM First venture? It's to disrupt premium commercial aviation. So, by providing low cost, high quality, lie flat sleeping beds, cabins in airplanes, and eventually to disrupt commercial aviation more broadly by making airplane real estate a commodity and then building flexible customer experiences on top of existing airline infrastructure, especially in the expanding low-cost, long-haul aviation sector. Now, I know that your community is largely surrounding IT and IT-enabled, so why is this IT-enabled? You know, I would want you to consider this eventually, and I know it's sort of an overstated phrase, as sort of the Uber of aviation, of flying. So trying to uh, divorce or cut off the customer experience um, where the value is from the airline itself. So what are we building? These private sleeping studios. So we're providing the customer with a full flat sleeping space, a private cabin, um, and this comes from a uh, collapsible, it collapses into a duffel bag style kit that builds on top of rows of three economy seat, uh, economy seats in airplanes. So standard economy seats on the A320, A350, 737, 787. So these are the major airplanes, uh, and particularly in their, their new generations that are being used um, in the American uh, aviation sector and worldwide by low cost uh, airlines. We're pricing this in the initial pricing model, something like 50 to 80% of a domestic uh, first class or international business class ticket where there might be something that's even closely comparable. Um, so we can go to the next slide, please. You can have a look at how it looks. So here is uh, the design. Um, you know, I, I put on the first slide that I'm based in Washington. My industrial designer is based in San Francisco, so we're working between the two cities. Um, mm -hmm. Again. You can see what this is. So we're, uh, it's, it's a, a sort of tech-enabled cabin that has an upholstered wall, a privacy curtain for the, uh, near, at the aisle, and you have a five-foot long, so it's you know, only as long as three economy seats, and that has to be clear from up front, but it creates a full flat sleeping surface um, in places where that just doesn't exist today, which is almost all domestic U.S. flights, uh, and we would be looking obviously at transcontinental, particularly red-eye flights, um, except for a couple of them between New York and L.A. and New York and San Francisco, um, where there's high demand for lying flat and sleeping, and airlines are investing huge amounts 
uh, to try to boost those, um, those offerings. So we're going to do that instantly, much more flexibly, and on all routes. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So the concept of PM first, uh, so here we see a picture um, with the nearest thing that exists at the moment, uh, which is in Air New Zealand. And what they've done is built uh, brand new infrastructure, and these are uh, economy class seats where the footrest sort of flips up and creates a lip, creating a full flat lying space. But from the point of view of the customer, you see, at least in this picture, what we're creating. So you're creating a sleeping space in economy, very similar to this, even though ours would be uh, better than that in the sense that there's a curtain and that it's uh, uh, more enabled. So the real philosophy behind the company is that, you know, even on something like Spirit Airlines, I can build you a beautiful uh, space. And so that really building a beautiful experience uh, is about imagination and bringing uh, Good, you know, bringing luxury goods into a, an existing space. Uh, can we go into the next uh, slide, please? So obviously beyond just our, you know, premium millennial uh, business uh, uh, target customer base, uh, there's a whole other uh, wide uh, base of customers. Uh, for example, you know, young mothers, uh, elderly passengers, disabled passengers, nervous flyers. There's a whole range of people for whom having a private lie down enclosed space while flying at a reasonable cost uh, is hugely beneficial and when, where there's a, a huge demand. Uh, next slide, please. So again, it's not just that we're creating a bed. Uh, this is a surrounded cocoon. Uh, so you have, uh, you know, customers that are inside an enclosed space as a captive audience for several hours. Uh, the thing uh, is tech-enabled so that it has sort of ambient lighting. It's controlled through a central uh, tablet computer uh, where the in-flight entertainment system is as well. Um, and so the the lighting and it integrates with uh, the in-flight entertainment um, to really create a very adaptable uh, environment that can uh, that can sync uh, with uh, what's going on on the in-flight entertainment. Um, mm -hmm. What does this create? Also huge amounts of cross-marketing opportunities. Uh, people like Netflix, Amazon, uh, highlighting foods and countries and products. Um, and what it does eventually is because you know the customer would this would work across several airlines. Uh, the customer can bring a customized personal experience across airlines. Um, so it, the, it, it follows them. Um, this uh, business model is scalable. So it, it works, yeah, it, I would like to understand the business model. What are you thinking? Is it are airlines um, doing this with a certain amount of economy speeds and they're assigning sure. to this model? Or are we talking about, uh, you know, balance inventory, extra inventory um, that is, you know, perishing basically, and they want to offer it like this. What is what is the assumption here? So it works in partnership with airlines, and the assumption is that um, it creates a flexible optimization uh, for airline for filling airplanes. Um, so eventually, wh where is there uh, lost value on the plane? It's where uh, flights have been undersold. Um, so what this allows is what, what would go what would happen is that. Uh, my company leases to the airlines uh, in a partnership with airlines. When the customer arrives onto the plane, they go onto the plane. This is already set up, let's say, probably sort of near the back of the plane, as a sleeping cabin. Um, and so it works in conjunction with the current um, logistics and operations of the airline. Uh, so the uh, cabin crew installs these in something like 10 to 15 seconds from a duffel bag. Um, kit that is put at the plane before uh, before boarding, um, mm -hmm. and they put them up and take them down as is required and as the demand is there uh, for these cabins. What you would do okay. is essentially go, when you book your flight, you would book a sleeping cabin as opposed to an economy class seat or a premium class seat. You book a sleeping cabin, and when you arrive on the plane, you have a fully enclosed bed waiting for you. Um, okay. So what, and what is the validation down, that you've got done on this uh, validation exercise? Have you talked to airlines? Are they responding? Yes, yeah, I have. So I've um, talked not with current airlines because we don't want to, because you know I want to have all the ducks in the row before we actually approach uh, current airlines about partnerships. But I've spoken, for example, um, with past CEOs from Spirit Airlines and from JetBlue who find it extremely interesting because essentially what it's doing is extracting value from undersold flights. So what's the proposition for airlines? It's extremely flexible. Um, we want to use a transparent pricing model where it's about three times an economy class 
seat. Uh, what does this do for the airlines? It means that they can immediately sell uh, much more seats on their plane. They're selling, you know, three seats for one person, which makes lower weight. Um, they can optimize the configuration. They can provide last-minute upgrades that can monetize unsold seats. Um, and of course, because it's targeted at low-cost airlines, it's unlikely idea. to cannibalize the same premium service. Um, and what we're working with is to negotiate a revenue sharing model. So because these are leased to airlines, let's say a customer comes on, uh, the airline would essentially sell me three seats for the price of two at whatever the prevailing economy class price is within their pricing algorithms at any moment. So we're not creating any new pricing algorithms. Um, and then eventually, uh, you know, they are selling these seats um, uh, and, you know, basically creating instant revenue for the airline. So what we're trying to achieve is absolute minimal impact on existing airline operations and at the same time basically providing instant revenue for the airline. So we want to make this as plug and play as possible. PM first takes care of all the uh, logistics with the kit, with the cleaning, with the replenishing, uh, and eventually airlines just partner with this and uh, make instant revenues across the board. Uh, it uh, you know, obviously uh, ups also their revenues per passenger. Um, and where do we take the value? Well, we use the, essentially the revenue from the third seat to cover all of our costs and also to extract a profit. Um, the path to market. So where, where do we now? We're developed, the sleeper one is the kit that develops, that goes on top of the seat that um, has a prototype that's already been built in San Francisco. Uh, there's a website that would eventually be a portal to, uh, a, an alternative portal to book these because what I want to do is when we're talking about multiple airlines down the road, that you can book across the airline. So you know you're booking a cabin, but you can book across airlines. Then having sort of an in-flight entertainment system, which is essentially the uh, programming on the pad that controls both the cabin and the entertainment. Um, and then of course, developing these sort of special PM first experiences, which are take full advantage of the surrounding technology inside the cabin, which you can think of sort of like a stage. Philippe, um, so okay, I, I think we understand what you're doing. I want to give you a bit of feedback. Please. Um, you know, for me, the real test is to get feedback from the airlines, whether they will do mm -hmm. it, and if they do it, what, you know, what the devil's going to be in the details, right? You're talking about so many touch points where you're going to have to interface with the airline and so many touch points that will have to go right. So you're going to need to work out all of those details. But And, and I, I almost suggest that at this point, you really start talking to the airlines and immerse yourselves in, you know, talking to lots of airline decision makers who can give you direct feedback on what would it take for them to work with you in this mode. Because if you don't do that and if you keep kind of building stuff in vacuum, the chances of your being able to hit the right product market fit is low. So, you know, before, I know you, you said you don't want to talk to the airlines right now, you're talking to past airline executives, that really doesn't matter. Past airline executives, yeah, they're giving you conjectures. You need to talk to airlines who are active and who are your customers, and that's, you need to do that ASAP. You need to talk to 50 airlines and really immerse yourself in the customers and see what their point of view is. Well, I appreciate right that. Away. In fact, the, the the strategy at the moment is at the end of this month starting to talk with particularly uh, emerging markets where I'm going to go out to uh, the Gulf and talk with Gulf Air, which is an emerging market airline that has seat capacity problems and talk with the chairman of the company there. Because eventually what I'd like to do is to be able to have a launch customer so that I can create proof of concept, prove that the logistics systems work with minimal impact on the airline. And, and then once you have this proof of concept, we can start talking to much larger customers um, uh, about rolling out beyond that. But that, that's sort of the strategy at the moment. I'm not sure if that's something that you think would, would make sense. I'm trying to scale up I, the I would like you to go airlines. talk to more airlines. Okay. Whatever, be, whatever your anchor partner may be, I would like you to get feedback from multiple airlines, not just one airline. I would like you to go talk to 50 airlines and get really detailed customer immersion. That's, our, that's the way we do customer validation. And, and, you know, that is the best way to ensure product market fit in a, in a new product is to really immerse yourselves in customers. Great. Um, and also in terms of looking at um, potential investors, I mean, 
um, you know, obviously this, this, the costs are, are relatively low to start up, and eventually um, the returns can be very, very high. Um, so I'm not necessarily worried about getting funding so far, I'm self-funding. Um, but is to have a strategic investor. That's what's very interesting for me. So somebody who not only is willing to put some money on the table, not necessarily a whole lot, but also um, would be have you know be able to provide some of the, the the connections, the experience with airline logistics, with some of those those things that you were mentioning. So Philip, I haven't seen an investor pitch. I haven't seen a TAM. I haven't seen customer validation. I haven't seen any of these, you know, I, don't, I haven't seen a proper pricing model analysis. I haven't seen mm -hmm. you know, the assumptions leading up to a bottom-up TAM analysis. All these things determine whether your project is even fundable by investors or not. So that's something you should create. You should, you know, create a bottom-up TAM analysis model is an essential piece uh, to figure out what is your funding strategy. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah, Great. so I, it's a very interesting idea. I mean, you know, um, and I imagine that there are, uh, you know, there's a lot of extra capacity in certain routes that are not high traffic routes where airlines basically fly empty and uh, and maybe there are, you know, takers for, um, for something more uh, luxurious, but I don't know the numbers on those and I don't know, you know, you have to create a model to see how big a company can you build with this, because if it's too niche a company, then there are a limited number of investors who would be willing to work with you. And in, in that case, you can still build a bootstrap business, that's fine, but you do need customers who, you know, start producing revenue for you to keep going with it then. Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, the the modeling that we've worked on on rollouts, for example, with someone like the Alaska Virgin America merger, which is coming, um, assumes something like six of these on each flight that's over four hours within their network, um, and the revenues come out to about a million dollars per day, which is uh, which is quite high based on this based on this modeling. Um, but I fully take your points on board, and I appreciate your time. The revenues for you is a million dollars a day, or the revenues for the airline is a million dollars a day. Revenues for PM first, revenues for the – assuming full rollout across the entire network of an airline like Virgin America and Alaska. Uh, because, again, the, the, the profit for the company is coming out of a third seat, um, so it's basically the, the revenues from well, that it, third seat on any particular – Philip, look, if, if with minimum effort, minimum investment, you can start showing million dollars a day kind of revenue – then you don't need financing, and everybody will be falling all over themselves to finance you. So if Great. you can prove that assumption, there is going to be no problem with financing. Great. Okay. Thank you very much, Ramana. I really appreciate it. Very interesting. I, I really like your creativity. It's very, very interesting. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, folks. Um, we are going to, I'm going to spend this few minutes explaining to you how to use one million by one minute. It seems like our second presenter is a no-show, which we don't like at all because we hold a slot for people and then if they don't show up, that's not, that's not good, that's not right. Anyway, um, if you like what we are doing here in one million by one million, bring serious entrepreneurs into the program. We have a great platform. We have great methodology and methodology works because now we have entrepreneurs who have, you know, had some time, some runway to build companies. We, our largest company um, has over 100,000 customers, has raised $149 million. We have companies that are already bootstrap companies that have gotten to $10 million in revenue. We have lots of companies that have gotten to $1 million in revenue. So we know that our methodology works. Now you have to... Uh, help us scale. You know, if you like what we are doing here, help us scale. Help us get the word around. And use the resources. There's a ton of resources on the website, 1m1m.com. The blog is free. Just by following the blog, you'll learn a lot. The Entrepreneur Journeys book series, there are 12 volumes. You'll learn a lot just by following those books and double-clicking down on specific topics, whether it's bootstrapping with a paycheck, bootstrapping using services, positioning, Billion dollar unicorns. Each of those topics have been dealt with in case studies. We have 
Over 800 case studies of successful entrepreneurs, and they have shared generously how they have done it. And you get to stand on the shoulder of giants. Um, this is our 385th roundtable. We have every week these three roundtables. You can come and get some help and brainstorm about your strategy here. We have the full acceleration program that is 1M by 1M premium. You can join the program for extensive methodology guidance, full curriculum, business development, strategy consulting, and you can also get help with financing and media relations. This is a $1,000 annual membership fee program. And uh, use the 1M1M one one self-assessment and see where you are right now in terms of your strategy, your um, you know, validation level, et cetera. If you get stuck with methodology points, uh, you can use 1M1M one one basic to learn the curriculum and methodology and plug your methodology gaps. That's the $99 a month. You can, if you can just allocate like 50 hours in a month to just study, this is a very fast and, and effective way of bridging a lot of your, a lot of first time entrepreneurs methodology gap. So dig around on the website. There's a ton of information. You can learn lots from all this uh, material there. You can figure out whether this program is for you or not. There's FAQs, video FAQs, what to expect from the program, description of the curriculum and so forth. We do work with case studies mostly. Everything you're learning here is because Somebody else has figured out a piece of methodology which we have incorporated into the program's overall methodology. And we focus on lean, capital-efficient bootstrap startups. And of course, you know, it's okay to raise money, but we have to bootstrap first, raise money later most of the time, just because that's how the industry operates. Um, that's pretty much it. We have free roundtables pretty much every week until the end of March. And then we have also in-person rendezvous in Menlo Park. Um, the rest of February, we have a rendezvous every week. So uh, please come to any of these sessions or multiple sessions, rendezvous, in-person rendezvous, roundtables, whatever, and we'll be happy to work with you, listen to your situation, give you some guidance, and hope to help you. So line is open for calls. Please feel free to call. Use the public chat for questions comments, introductions, tell us where you're coming from, what brings you here, how can we help. And let me also introduce you to Irina Patterson, Irina at 1M1M.com. She is your contact to um, ask questions about the 1M1M program. And that's it. Questions, folks? Questions, comments, introductions? Anybody? If you don't have any questions, we're going to adjourn, and we'll meet you back here uh, next week. And uh, please check the schedules online. Free public roundtables tab on the 1M1M site will give you access to the roundtable schedule. and. Uh, and the registration links and the rendezvous schedule is also under the rendezvous link. So let's, um, you know, have you registered and we will see you soon. Bye everybody. Thanks for coming today.